questions submitted today will be de-identified and answered during the webinar as time permits. Also, the slides and recording of today's webinar will be available to you on our NIH Common Fund website within the next several weeks. The address is shown on the bottom of this slide. HTTPS colon backslash backslash commonfund.nih.gov backslash diversity. The outline for today's webinar includes seven topics. In general, I will cover topics in the same order they appear in the funding opportunity announcement, which include the purpose, award information, eligibility information, followed by application instructions, and the timeline. Part six, which covers application review information, will be presented by Dr. Carol Swartz from the NIH Center for Scientific Review, or CSR. After Dr. Swartz's presentation, I'll return to, to discuss some frequently asked questions and open the floor so that our NIH team in the room can also help respond to additional questions that you may have submitted during the webinar. The primary purpose of the NRMN initiative is to develop a national consortium to enhance the training and career development of individuals from diverse backgrounds who are pursuing biomedical, clinical, and social science research careers through enhanced networking and mentorship activities. Now this slide is a recap of the Common Fund Diversity Program's overarching strategy. Again, the NRMN is one of three interrelated initiatives being implemented to enhance the diversity of the NIH-funded workforce. I will present the overview for the NRMN, followed by a review of the CEC. As mentioned, the BUILD initiative was reviewed earlier in the agenda by my colleague, Dr. Toya Randolph. Specific goals of the NRMN include working with the Diversity Program Consortium to establish core competencies and hallmarks of, of success at each career stage of biomedical research careers. Those stages are undergraduate, graduate, postdoctoral, and early career faculty. The goals also include developing standards and metrics for effective face-to-face -face and online mentoring. Also, we're interested in connecting mentees in the biomedical research workforce with experienced mentors, including those with NIH funding and developing innovative and novel methods to teach effective mentoring skills. The NRMN goals also include providing professional development activities to mentees, for example, training opportunities in grantsmanship and career survival strategies, and or facilitating participation in existing development opportunities outside of the network. The goals also include enhancing mentee access to information and perceptions about biomedical research careers and increasing understanding of the requirements and strategies for success in biomedical careers. We're also interested in creating effective networking opportunities for mentees from diverse backgrounds with the larger biomedical research community. And we're interested in, in enhancing the ability of the mentees to attain NIH funding. Let's now turn our attention to award information. As you may know, the award mechanism for the NRMN is a U54, which is also known as a cooperative agreement. A cooperative agreement is a support mechanism used when there will be substantial federal, scientific, and or programmatic involvement that is above and beyond the normal stewardship roles in awards. Substantial involvement means that after all awards are made, NIH staff will assist, guide, coordinate, or participate in project activities. To achieve the program goals, the, the NRMN awardee will also maintain an ongoing collaboration with the BUILD and CEC awardees through the Diversity Program Consortium.
The NIH Common Fund intends to commit $2,225,000 in FY14 for a single NRMN award, and that is contingent upon availability of funds. Application budgets are limited to the same amount in total, total costs annually, which does include institutional or consortia FNA, also known as indirects. Please note that we do recognize that allowable indirect rates vary and are based on institutions' negotiated cost rate agreement with the federal government. Importantly, the project period is five years. Finally, I want to note that an evaluation of the initiative will be conducted over the first five years of the program, and this evaluation will determine whether the initiative will be continued for an additional five years as currently configured, continued with modifications, or discontinued. If warranted, a funding opportunity announcement will be issued for a second five-year award, and this FOA may be subject to an open competition. This slide provides some eligibility information. Eligible institutions and organizations include academic institutions, professional societies, student organizations, or other relevant organizations. Applicants should have a demonstrated track record in providing mentorship or coordinating mentorship activities for diverse mentees. Non-domestic entities or non-domestic components of U.S. organizations are not eligible to apply. Applications may include foreign components as defined in the NIH grants policy statement. As a reminder, applicants are not required to be recipients of a planning grant to apply for or to be awarded an NRMN U54 award. There's also eligibility information about mentees and mentors. Regarding eligibility for mentees, the NRMN will collaborate with BUILD institutions to provide mentorship to BUILD trainees and participants. The NRMN is also expected to provide mentorship and, and networking opportunities to undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and early career faculty who are, who are at institutions not in the BUILD program. Now, eligible mentors are considered individuals with academic research, academic research or professional expertise, and an interest in mentoring biomedical scientists. Mentors from, from foreign institutions may be included. However, most mentors, mentors are expected to be from U.S. institutions. An important note is below at the, at the bottom of the screen, and that is although the network is expected to be a national network, an important note is that beyond the inclusion of BUILD trainees and participants, the number of mentees and mentors included is to be determined by the applicant and described in your application. I'll now cover um, some information about application instructions. As many of you already know, this FOA application is complex with multiple components. Each NRMN application must include the following five components. The overall component, the administrative core, mentorship and networking core, the mentor training core, and the professional development core. Since the different cores do have unique requirements and instructions, all potential applicants are highly encouraged to read the instructions carefully. And also, please remember that the research strategy section for this component is limited to 12 pages and does not apply to the specific aims page or other elements that are required for the research plan. This slide provides additional information about application instructions, and it highlights some of the considerations for each component or core that should be considered as you prepare your application. First, let's get oriented to the table, which I do realize has a lot of information. Across the top of the table are titles of the components or cores, followed by a graphic underneath and a brief description of information required for each. I'll review them briefly, very briefly, starting from left to right. In the overall component on the left, it is important to describe the overall vision of the network. In this component, 
applications should applicants should also discuss the potential of network infrastructure and resources that can be sustained and or disseminated after the NIH funding period has ended. Next is the administrative core. A plan or description should be provided for items such as the organizational or governance structure, roles and responsibility of personnel, communication procedures across the network, and infrastructure for data collection, storing, and reporting, for example. In the mentorship and networking core, descriptions are needed for items such as the strategic structure and operation of the network, innovative mentoring approaches, and a tailored mentoring plan for each career stage, as an example. Mentor training core, the following items should be included. The conceptual model for mentoring activities, the framework for standards and metrics of face-to-face -face and in-person mentoring, and a consideration about cultural competence training, as an example. And then finally, the professional development core should include items such as tailored professional development activities for each career stage, eligibility and selection for mentees and mentors, facilitation of mentees' participation in additional activities, as well as the expected impact. Again, this slide does provide an overview only of the type of information that should be included in each component or core. Please do remember that the con content in this table is not all-inclusive, and applicants should read the instructions carefully for detailed requirements. As you are developing ideas and preparing your applications, uh, I want to emphasize that responsiveness criteria is critical to your success in having your application reviewed. For the NRMN funding opportunity announcement, there are two areas of focus that would not be considered responsive. Focusing exclusively on a particular scientific discipline, research topic area, or career stage such as early career faculty, or a demographic group is not considered responsive to this FOA. Focusing on general science, technology, engineering, and mathematics or STEM education, or on the preparation of individuals exclusively for clinical teaching and other non-research careers is not responsive to this FOA. Again, responsiveness is a critical part of the process, and applications that are not responsive will not be peer-reviewed. On this slide, we have some very important dates to remember about the application and award timeline. The first document that may be submitted is the, is the letter of intent. The letters which were originally due on February the 18th, 2014, are now due on March the 2nd. While these letters are optional, that is not required, they do give the NIH team a general sense of the number of applications that may be submitted and will help us to plan for review. The application receipt date, which was originally originally published as March 18th as well, has now been changed, March 18th, excuse me, 2014, has been changed to April the 2nd. The CSR peer review will be completed by July 2014. The NIMHD Advisory Council review and the NIH Common Fund review will be completed in September, making the earliest award date, start date, September 2014. Also, the program kickoff meeting will be held in Bethesda, Maryland, no later than November 2014. So as a reminder, all applicants and all awardees will need to budget properly in order to attend this meeting. For more information about the updated dates you see on this timeline, please refer to notice number NOT-RM-14-004. Now this concludes my presentation about the application instructions for the NRMN initiative. I do want to remind you that you, we are still re accepting questions through the email at buildnrmncec at nih.gov. And at this time, Dr. Carol Swartz from the NIH Center for Scientific Review, CSR, will review application review information. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. I want to talk briefly about aspects of peer review and 
the criteria that are used to evaluate applications. Applications received will be assigned to the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD. The Center for Scientific Review staff assess applications for completeness. NIMHD program staff assess applications for responsiveness. A scientific review officer from CSR assembles a panel of experts from the extramural scientific community to perform review. At least three assigned reviewers per application will assess applications based on established review criteria. Those include significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. At the peer review meeting, applications undergo a selection process in which only those deemed to have the highest scientific and technical merit, generally the top half of applications, will be discussed and assigned an overall impact score. For discussed applications, assigned reviewers summarize their prepared critiques for the group and an open discussion follows. Final scoring of overall impact is conducted by private ballot. The final overall impact score is based on the average of all voting reviewers. Scores range from 10, which is exceptional, to 90 or 4. Overall impact is the likelihood that that project will exert sustained transformative influence on the field. This evaluation is based on consideration of, first, the five core review criteria, significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment, and additional review criteria as applicable for the project proposed and specified in the FOA. We will come back to the additional review criteria that are spe specified in the FOA. First, let us review the five core review criteria. This table shows at the top the four, five scored review criteria, the standard review criteria, significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. Below each of the criteria are examples, first examples based on standard review, and then examples based on the specific aspects uh, included in the NRMN FOA. Under significance, an example of a standard review criterion for significance is if the aims are achieved, how will knowledge be advanced? An example of those of the significance criterion that would be specific for the NRMN FOA is does the vision established by the PI or PD represent a significant advance over current mentoring strategies? In considering investigators, the standard review criteria include questions like, are the investigators appropriately trained and well suited to carry out this work? Specifically for the NRMN FOA, the question might be, do the investigators show evidence of the ability to lead develop and direct a national network of collaborative mentorship efforts. Under innovation, the standard review criterion is, is a refinement, improvement, or new application of theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies, instrumentation, or interventions proposed. Specific to the NRMN FOA, a question might be, does the application describe novel and innovative mentorship networking, and professional development strategies. Under approach, a standard uh, criterion would be, are the conceptual framework and planned activities appropriate to the aims of the network? Specific for the NRMM FOA, will all career stages and disciplines be well served? And under environment, the standard review criterion would be, does the environment in which the work will be done contribute to the probability of success. Remember that this table gives 
only examples of the kinds of information that should be provided for each of the five core criteria. Note that there are examples that are for standard review and examples that are specific for the build FOA. Applicants should consider the entire list of questions for each criterion provided in the FOA when writing the application. In addition to these five core criteria, reviewers will consider these additional review criteria. Administrative core, mentorship and networking core, mentor training core, and professional development core. In addition, protections for human subjects, inclusion of women, minority, and children, vertebrate animals, and biohazards will also be considered. Reviewers will factor these additional review criteria along with the standard review criteria into the overall impact score. This table provides examples of the additional review criteria contained in the FOA. So for example, in the administrative core, is the organizational and governance structure well described and appropriate to manage and oversee the proposed NRMN strategy? Under mentorship and networking core, are the structure and operation of the network described, including any specific eligibility criteria for mentees or mentors? how mentees and mentors will be identified and recruited for inclusion in the network, and how mentees will be connected with mentors. Under the Mentor Training Corps, is an appropriate conceptual model for effective mentoring well described and is it compelling? Is an appropriate description of how it guides proposed mentoring activities included? Under Professional Development Corps, our proposed, develop, uh, our proposed professional development activities, such as grant writing, seminars, mock grant reviews, professional shadowing, and so forth, that will be offered through the NRMN appropriate. Remember, the criteria above serve as examples only. Applicants could, should consider the entire list of questions in the FOA for each core. At this time, Pamela Thornton will return to cover frequently asked questions. Thank you, Dr. Swartz. Uh, before the team responds uh, to questions you submitted during today's webinar, I'm not sure if we have many at this point, let me take some time to read a few FAQs we've received so far before the webinar. The first question is, can institutions apply for the NRMN Cooperative Agreement Award if they did not receive a planning grant? Yes, you can. The NRMN Funding Opportunity Announcement is an open competition and all eligible institu institutions may apply. Will the planning grantees be given an advantage in the competition for the NRMN Award? No. Applications for the NRMN award will be reviewed based on their own merits and not on whether or not the applicant is a planning grant recipient. Will multiple NRMN awards be issued similar to the planning grants? No. The NIH fund, Common Fund intends to fund or award one NRMN cooperative agreement for this program. Next question. Is the network only for those mentees from backgrounds traditionally underrepresented in the biomedical research workforce? No, it is not. The network is intended to serve any eligible mentee who may benefit from additional mentoring beyond what they are receiving at their home institutions. However, a critical element of the network will be the capacity, capacity and ability to provide effective mentoring and networking opportunities to a diverse population of mentees, including those from backgrounds underrepresented in the biomedical research workforce. How can the application describe what will be done with BUILD trainees and participants, also known as mentees, without knowing what the BUILD awardees will be doing for training and or mentoring activities? Good question. Applicants should explain how network activities 
would be designed to complement rather than duplicate activities provided by build sites. Because details about build activities at specific sites will not be available until after the awards are made, applicants should now refer to the build FOA, which is RFA-RM-13-016, to identify and to identify the broad categories of activities in which build sites are expected to engage and summarize a strategy for meeting the complementary mentoring needs of build trainees and participants. This is a question that uh, we've received a lot at program, and we're including it here for that purpose. Can mentors receive salary support for their mentoring services? In general, it is not expected that mentors will receive salary support for their participation in the network. Please note that salary support should only be provided for individuals who are substantially involved in the, in the leadership, development, or conduct of the network. Which career stage should receive the most mentoring support? All career stages from undergraduate to early career faculty stages must be included in the network and must receive mentoring in some way. Applicants will make their own determination about the level of emphasis that mentees from each career stage receive. The next question is also a question we've received um, quite a bit at program, and it is, how many mentees and mentors should be included in the proposed network? Beyond the inclusion of build trainees and participants, the number of mentee and mentors included in the network is to be determined by the applicant and described in your applications. Applicants will make their own determination about the right balance between the size and or scale of the network and the range and or intensity of mentoring activities offered. Importantly, although the network awardee or the NRMN awardee will ultimately determine that size or scope of the network, the NRMN must have a nationwide focus providing mentoring services across the biomedical disciplines and across the career stages. As you might expect, we do, we do anticipate that various applicants will come up with different approaches to address this issue. Okay, here's a question about pilot programs. Is a pilot project program required? No, it's not. Including a pilot in the application is not required. Though not required, a pilot may be used to provide seed funding to pilot or evaluate new mentoring and or networking activities for the Mentorship and Networking Core, the Mentor Training Core, and Professional Development Core that you saw on the table. This is another very popular question lately. Can a collaborator on an NRMN application also be included on a BUILD or CEC application? Yes. Eligible collaborators may be included in multiple applications, including BUILD, NRMN, and the CEC application. However, and this is what's important to remember, the CEC awardee may not receive funds from a BUILD or NRMN award. So that means if a BUILD or NRMN awardee includes a partnership with what becomes a CEC awardee, the CEC awardee or participants to those projects may be required to withdraw participation. Next question. Is it necessary for NRMN applicants to collaborate with specific CEC or specific build applicants as part of, of, as part of their application? No, it is not. The coordination among the NRMN, the build, and CEC programs will be established after the awards are made. Applicants, therefore, should, should identify plans to work with build institutions in more of a general sense rather than identifying particular institutions. Is an evaluation component required in the NRNN application? No, it's not. Including an evaluation of the network in your application is not required. The NRMN awardee will work collaboratively with the CEC to evaluate the program.
And out of all the questions we've seen so far, I would say that this is probably the most frequently asked question so far that we've received at program. And it, and it reads, if I am using the multiple PI option for the application, which institution or institutions will be considered the applicant institution? The multiple PI option is, of course, allowed for this application. However, only one institution can be considered the applicant institution. And that applicant institution should be and will be the contact PI's institutional home or employer. Collaborators from other institutions do not count against the application limit of those institutions. Now, which institution is designated the applicant institution and the number of collaborators and or roles are decided by the collaborators and the applicant institution. The NIH does not make these decisions. Okay, finally, the last question that we have on the webinar slide is, is the funding going to end in five years or will there be an opportunity for renewal? The NIH Common Fund has committed to support this diversity program for 10 years with the expectation that this time frame will be required to develop and assess new approaches to training and mentoring. All awards will have a five-year project period. Progress of the program will be assessed throughout the five-year period, provided that innovative and potentially transformative approaches are being developed, an FOA for continuation of the program will be released. Competition for the second phase of the program may be open to new applicants as well as continuing awardees. Therefore, we want to emphasize that applicants should consider sustainability beyond the external funding. Now that does conclude the FAQs from the webinar. Now I'd just like to open the floor and check in with Dr. Jennifer Alvidrez to see if there are additional questions that have been emailed since we've started the webinar. Okay, um, we have gotten some questions. Can we provide travel awards so that mentees can meet mentors either at the mentors institution or a conference? Yes, travel um, for mentees or mentors is allowable. The next question, I think, was addressed um, by Dr. Thornton, but the question is, may an individual or institution participate in both the NRMN as a consultant or subcontractor or, partic or participant and also be eligible for the CEC? So there are no restrictions regarding eligibility um, to apply for grants, but the CEC awardee may not participate as a collaborator on build or NRMN awards, and this is something that can be adjusted post-award. Is the NIMHD or the Common Fund Council decide, the deciding body on funding? So the, um, the NRMN awards will be peer-reviewed, and then they will receive second-level peer review by the NIMHD Council. Final funding decisions will be made by the Common Fund. Please describe the steering committees required for uh, the BUILD awards and the NRMN award and how, how they will integrate with one another. So, each, so the mentoring award and each individual BUILD awards will have their own steering committees. There will be an umbrella executive steering committee as well as the CEC. The executive steering committee will be comprised of representatives from all of the individual award steering committees. And that will be coordinated by the CEC. Please clarify who the project scientists are. So these are NIH staff members who will who have expertise in the areas of mentoring and training and workforce diversity and these individuals will be identified in the notice of award once awards are made. Should letters of support be included in each section of the grant? If so, will they count against the 12-page limit for each section? Um, you, you do have the option of including letters of support um, in the different sections of the grant. They do not count against the page limit. The page limit, uh, the 12-page limit is um, regarding the research strategy section. Other components of the research plan do not have page limits except for the specific aim section, which has a one-page limit. Is that correct? <laughs> okay. 
do descriptions to allow pilot projects have to be included in each core section in a redundant manner or can there be one description provided in one section that is referenced in the other sections? If pilot projects are proposed, they should be aligned with the activities of the particular core. So um, it would be envisioned that pilot projects about mentor training may be different, may have different structures, may have different award amounts than those that may be proposed in the mentoring or networking core, for example. Um, if, if applicants wish to propose a single program, they can clarify this in their application. If I'm a collaborator on an NRMN award and my institution receives a CEC award, will I be required to withdraw as a collaborator on the NRMN award? I think these are these arrangements, some may be more global at the institutional level and some may involve individuals at these institutions. So this is something that will be worked out post-award. I don't know that a blanket statement can be given, um, for example, about whether we're talking about someone serving as a consultant versus an entire school or division of a, an institution being involved in an award. So this, this can be sorted out post-award. If one section of the grant doesn't utilize an entire 12 pages, can the leftover pages be used for another section of the grant? No. And it is recommended that you go ahead and use the entire 12 pages for each section. <laughs> can you clarify what it means that programs focused on STEM will not be responsive? So. The clarification here is that it's not a focus on STEM, but it's a focus on STEM education. So the focus of the mentoring program is not to provide tutoring, for example, to teach undergraduates math. It's to provide mentoring uh, to um, assist with research training and professional development in STEM fields, so research in STEM fields or research in other related biomedical fields. So. It's not so much about STEM, but about STEM education. That is not the focus of this mentoring program. Why was it decided to fund only one mentoring network versus the BUILD, which will fund 10? The, the intent of a single network is to have a national network that serves the entire country as a way to complement the local or regional efforts that are being undertaken by the BUILD programs so that the BUILD programs could provide local mentoring and the, the uh, mentoring network would provide external mentors for those inst institutions as well as individuals who are not part of the BUILD programs. So a question was asked about so Pamela, Dr. Thornton answered a question about can institutions be on multiple applications? A parallel question is can investigators be on multiple applications? The answer is yes. For applications, can, it, can an investigator be a PI or a multiple PI on multiple applications? Yes, provided that only one application per institution is submitted. Does the NRMN use the 8% FNA rate used for institutional training grants? No, the network uses the negotiated FNA for that particular institution and the collaborating institutions. How will the NRMN data collection infrastructure be coordinated with the CEC data collection system? So I think perhaps the question is how much detail should we include about our data collection system? So the level of detail is specified in the application, more about the expertise, the general capacity uh, to be involved in data collection and evaluation rather than a specific data collection or evaluation plan to be included in the application. Is it possible to obtain a list of intended applicants for purposes of offering 
to be a subcontractor on the project application or also for collaboration. Uh, this, this information is not available to the public. However, there have been venues and other, there are other ways that potential applicants and collaborators can communicate amongst themselves, but NIH will not be releasing information about applicants. Um, information about awards will be made publicly available once those awards are made. If institutions agree to the 8% indirect rate, is that acceptable? Institutions, institutions have a federally negotiated um, F&A rate. Um, if the question is, can we take less indirect so that we get more direct, that would be a question that I would refer to our grants management office. So I would recommend that you contact uh, the, the contact on the uh, funding opportunity announcement. So I can recycle some of the questions from the BUILD webinar that are relevant um, here. Are we required to respond to the funding opportunity announcement instructions and the PHS 398 application instructions? Yes, to be responsive to this funding announcement, all applicants should carefully read and respond to the application instructions in the FOA as well as in the PHS 398. If specific elements are mentioned in the FOA application instructions, for example, the research strategy for the different cores, this means that the instructions for completing this element are different from the general instructions in the PHS 398. If no specific instructions are provided in the FOA for a particular element, applicants should follow the instructions regarding that element in the PHS 398 instructions. Can you just ask the question? We have a question on the floor. Oh. Again, recycling from the build webinar, um, letters of support. Uh, can we include letters of support for each component of the application as opposed to just in the overall component? And the answer is yes. Follow the PHS 398 instructions for each component. The research plan can include letters of support. Let me just read this question and then throw it out to the floor. The RFA instructs all applicants to include an overall component. A portion of this component is biographical sketches and facilities and resources. Our interpretation of the overall component is to provide information for the whole of all the cores. Is it the expectation of this RFA to include all bio sketches and facilities and, resource, and, facilities and resources from all areas into this section? then are the biosketches and resources associated to the particular cores included in those sections? Well, if you follow the PHS 398 instructions for each component, there is a section where you can include biosketches. Um, reviewers don't like to wade through thousands of biosketches uh, that are duplicated in various places in the application. so. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Swartz from CSR to uh, give you some guidance on that. I think that's good advice to put the biosketches where they belong and not simply in one spot where reviewers have to page back and forth. Anything that you can do to make it easier for the reviewers is very positive. Okay. I think that covers the questions that we've gotten via email about mentoring. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Alvidrez. We are ending uh, a little early, but I want to encourage you, if you still have questions, the email address will still be active um, after the webinar, and we will be answering questions through it. So please feel free to continue asking your question th questions through the build NRM NCEC at NIH.gov email address. In addition, this slide provides several points of contact that may be important to you. If you have program related questions, please contact me, Pamela Thornton. If you have questions related to the peer review process, please follow up with Dr. Mary Beth Shampoo, who is the SRO for this initiative. 
And if you have questions related to grants management, including budget questions, please contact Ms. Priscilla Grant. As a reminder, the slides and recording from today's webinar will be available on the NIH Common Fund website. We encourage you greatly to share this information with your potential collaborators who may not have been able to attend today's session. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll take another short break. For those of you planning to participate in the Coordination and Evaluation Center funding opportunity announcement portion of this webinar, that will begin promptly at 3.10 p.m. Um, our microphones will be on mute until that time, so if you're interested in the, the CEC initiative, please join us back at 3.10. Thank you.